Dreams can only become reality if the strength of the vision is matched by the energy of the people involved. The planning that goes into creating a large happening takes countless hours of work and a great deal of luck. The success of the Earth Air Fire Water Project was the result of having a strong vision, good organization, and enlightened people. We began by finding a place to begin a place where we could make our vision happen. We needed a large space that would provide for and support our varied demands. That space turned out to be the grounds of the John Woolman Quaker School. John Woolman is a private residential high school located in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains, a few miles from Nevada City in rural Northern California. The 320-acre school was an ideal setting for the workshop with ponds, pastures, gardens, orchards, wooded hills, and abundant opportunities for after-hour recreational activities. The project attracted over 40 students of all ages and levels of experience. The kiln built by those first-year workshop students is still being used for community firings in the spring and fall of each year. Due to distance and other commitments, the major players from the original gathering cannot always attend the firing festivities. However, they are sometimes seen lurking at the fringes, smelling the smoke, feeling the spontaneity of the dry cedar exploding in the fireboxes. The white heat of a flat cone 12 is truly mesmerizing. This film is an attempt to share our experience with you. Historically, the choice of a site for a kiln was dependent upon many things. Number one, a close, abundant supply of natural resources to support a pottery community. In this day of mass transportation, selecting a site for a kiln isn't dependent upon those things. It can be put just about anywhere where the infrastructure will allow. The main qualifiers for choosing the site to build the kiln was a feasible hillside in close proximity to a road, so needed materials could be moved to the construction area. We guessed at the degree of slope, as there were no specific figures available. We cleared the construction area of vegetation, debris, and topsoil, and laid a rough foundation of mine rock. We decided to build the kiln without the use of any mechanical measuring devices. The fanciest tools we used was a pump bob, a glass of water for leveling, and a stick for measuring about two feet long. The dimensions of the kiln were three sticks high, three sticks wide, and four sticks deep. The increment of rise between chambers turned out by accident to be one stick and four. Our plan was to construct the kiln from handmade unfired bricks. We started from scratch. Our material list was short, clay, water, and sharp river sand. 25 tons of bulk Lincoln 60 fire clay was trucked to the site, followed by a similar amount of sand. Large pits were dug and filled with water. Using approximately equal parts of clay and sand, a mixture was layered into the pits with shovels and the students mixed those materials with their feet. Additional clay and sand was added to the bring the brick mix to a wedgeable consistency. We constructed simple plastic lined swing door brick forms from dimension lumber. All of the needed sizes and shapes were marked and cut from clay pressed into those forms. Dry clay had to be applied to the forms after each batch of bricks was removed to keep the next batch from sticking. The completed kiln weighs nearly 30 tons. The shape of the arch was partially determined by the rise of the slope and the length of each chamber. The vertical differential between chambers was one stick. A combination of catenary and radius arches were married at their apex to create the arch form that was used. We started building from the top down so each additional chamber would lean on the one above it. Each chamber shared common walls with four interconnecting exhaust flues. Each flue port 
was a stick high and a third of a stick wide. The arch form was stilted into position with wedge-shaped chocks placed between the uprights of the arch support system and the bottom of the arch form to allow for easy removal when each section was finished. The common walls were three quarters of a stick wide. That allowed ascending and descending arch limbs to spring from a common platform. We laid the building blocks of the kiln on generous beds of mortar composed of the same mix as the bricks. Each course was tied with an alternating pattern of overlapping bricks. The arches were laid from both sides simultaneously and key bricks were sized with a hand axe and wet pressed to assure a perfect fit. After tying off the finished arch with a sturdy rope, we removed the form by knocking the chocks out, allowing the finished arch to stand free. The rope tie was left in place until the next arch was married to the structure. As the construction of common walls and arches proceeded down the hill, side walls, doors, ash draws, and stoke holes were created. We placed the doors adjacent to the back walls, thinking it would eliminate the leakage of secondary air into the chambers. The end walls at the top and the bottom of the kiln were secured with heavy metal braces. Hard brick was used to form a 12-foot chimney to gather and reduce the exhaust space. A metal pipe 20 feet long and 2 feet in diameter was placed on the sculpted base. Guy wires were attached to ground anchors to secure the stack. The chimney, excessive in height, allowed the smoke to clear an adjacent building. Massive guillotine dampers were placed at the bottom of the stack in an attempt to control the draft of the kiln. The glazes that we used for the first fire were composed of uh, naturally occurring materials located uh, within 20 miles of the kiln site. Those materials were soapstone dust, granite dust, various local slip clays, regular clay, wood ashes, and a few other odds and ends that we managed to pick up along the roadside. We constructed a simple balance beam to weigh the glaze materials. Some of the glazes turned out fine, others a bit sketchy. The first firing was done without kiln shelves or saggers. Students were taught to make their pieces stackable, creating piles that were to be arranged foot to foot, foot to lip, lip to foot, lip to lip, with a closed mouth piece capping the pile. Some of the piles reached all the way to the ceiling. Some of the piles fell down during the firing. You need a bunch of wood to fire one of these things, and we really didn't know how much enough was, so we got a lot. The close proximity of the Tahoe National Forest provided cheap, abundant logging debris for the price of a permit. Different groups of students took turns going to the woods to saw, split, and haul the needed material. Chopping wood from rounds to usable sizes takes a lot of labor, so we did that chore in the evening or in the shade of trees during the day. The stoke size split wood was transferred to both sides of the kiln and stacked. The length of the wood used was based on one half of the depth of the fireboxes. The first voyage of the kiln took 18 hours and consumed over four cords wood. We worked through the night and well into the next day. As the fire progressed through the chambers, stacks of pots fell, filling the stoke holes. They had to be broken and removed so the firing could continue. Excitement intensified as chamber after chamber reached maturity. The heat around the fireboxes was intense. The temperature in the final chamber went well past cone 13. The ground vibrated from the combustion and the metal chimney glowed bright red from exhaust heat. When the firing was finished, there were exhausted people lying all around the kiln, amazed at what they had accomplished. It is the spring of 2004. The kiln was built 33 years ago. Since then, 
Thousands of pairs of hands have stoked hundreds and hundreds of cords of wood into these fireboxes, firing the kiln more than 100 times, over 100,000 pieces. When we started this project, we were ignorant of a traditional knowledge base necessary to build and fire this type of kiln. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but in a sense, we were forced to. One might say that in this situation, ignorance was bliss. We just figured it would work, and for the most part, it did. Tenacity, Yankee ingenuity, and blind luck all went together to make the project a success. After the first firings were finished and the dust settled, the people who were responsible for building the kiln sat down, had a powwow, and made a list of things they felt needed to be accomplished to make it a better working unit. It took over 30 years to finish the things on that list. The most obvious thing that needed attention was the construction of fire grates. This allowed the kiln wind to pass through the fuel rather than over it and kept the sticks from piling up under the stoke ports. We put in short, sturdy bag walls that accomplished a number of things. It was our hope that it would keep errant sticks thrown in by overzealous stokers from knocking down the bungs of stuff and to direct the flames upward, keeping the heat from zooming across the bottom of the chambers and burning out those areas of the firing. The original design incorporated ash draws at the base of each stoke port. We soon discovered that they were unnecessary and they were closed, which eliminated the passage of secondary air into the lower section of the stacking areas. It also kept the sneakers of those stoking the kiln from catching on fire. During the fall, after the first workshop, we constructed a sturdy kiln shed made from sap cedar poles and corrugated roof tin. It was necessary to cover the unfired brick to keep them from dissolving in the weather. It is still standing and has only caught on fire a few times. We repair it as the need arises, sometimes replacing wooden structural parts and sometimes only re-securing the tin with longer nails. We replace the end walls on both sides of the kiln, making each chamber slightly wider. When the walls were rebuilt, the doors were moved from the back to the front allowing for quicker, more efficient loading. Chamber 6 is more exposed to the elements of snow, wind, and rain than the rest of the kiln. As a result, much erosion has taken place over the years, finally resulting in a structural integrity problem. In the summer of 2002, Chamber 6 was torn down and completely rebuilt. New handmade unfired bricks similar to the original were created a new arch form placed against the old ascending wall and chamber six was reborn. What you see here is the ascending common wall of chamber five and six with 30 years of accumulated melted wood ash covering the surface. On the other side we see the inside wall of the new construction that has only been fired a few times. It is barely toasted. We built a large fire mouth in the place of a very small one. Uh, to form a heat sink and sort of an anagama chamber at the bottom of the kiln. It works very well. It is fired to about cone 12 or 13, taking 10 hours and one to one and a half cords of wood. Although objects are placed inside, it is primarily used as a lever to fire the rest of the kiln. We made and installed different kinds of stoke ports, which made stoking much easier and stopped the secondary air from rushing over the fuel. The use of good kiln furniture is essential to fire any kiln successfully. We cut three sizes of kiln posts from good high temperature fire brick. Before each firing, all of the posts are checked and cleaned of rubble and the ends dipped in kiln wash. The kiln shelves we use are 14 by 16 by 1 inch Thorley Mullite. The shelves seen here are approximately 20 years old. The patterns on the shelves are created by wood ash drifting down and melting on the kiln wash around the base of the pots. The bottom shelves in each chamber are set and leveled with partial bricks arranged on the kiln floor. We attempt to maintain a standard stacking pattern in all of the chambers. 
Large bricks are placed on the floor shelves of the back bungs and no pieces are placed there. Their function is to baffle the movement of the flame and keep the envelope of fire moving over and around the bungs of shelves and out the flues in the back wall. The distance between the bungs of shelving and the side and the back walls is kept as wide as possible, never getting closer than the width of a hand. When the back bung of shelving reaches the beginning of the arch, it is stopped and large pieces are placed there. The front bung of shelves are set approximately three in inches in front of the back bung with a common floor level. The shelves in the front stack are vertically staggered relative to the shelves in the back and reach nearly to the ceiling. The distance from the front of the shelving to the bag wall varies in each chamber. It is necessary to maintain as much distance from the bag wall to the front posts as possible. When a group gathers together to do a communal firing, they bring bisque things that they have made at their individual studios. The glazes are prepared by a small core group of local folks. Most of the glazes are made from combinations of wood ash, volcanic ash, rice hull ash, and local clays. By varying the amounts of those materials and adding colorants, a great variety of looks are available. As many as 60 potters work simultaneously at the glazing area to accomplish their task. As the pieces are completed, they are staged on a temporary shelving area in front of the waiting chambers. Loading the kiln is always a busy time. It takes a crew of about 50 people. Each chamber has a stack master inside who receives pieces from the crews outside. The pots are selected to fit the stacking arrangement. The shelves are set at variable heights with larger pieces set on the top. The doors are closed. Special bricks are shaped to fit the top of the door arches. When this is completed, the doors are mudded and the fire is ready to begin. Um, I believe in the hand of man and I believe in experience, uh, cooperation, coordination, and learning, learning about yourself, about fire, about uh, possibilities, and using your past experiences to extend uh, your knowledge and your learning into the future. In the old days, when we started these things, uh, there wasn't the information, uh, both technically and philosophically, that we have today. We have many more camps. We have, uh, you know, the followers of Volkas, people that want to make fine art, people that want to make just pots, people that want to make low fire, people that want to make high fire, people that want to make wood fire. And uh, it's just a, a much more diverse community. I'm glad that there are some people that are still interested in wood fire and in the process because that, uh, is an important part of the field, both uh, historically, traditionally, and, uh, and currently. My initial experience at Grass Valley came in 1973 when I was a uh, young man driving around Northern California and visited the wood fire workshop with a friend very impressed with all the activity that was going on, all the people from all over the country making pots, crazily making pots, uh, with a lot of love and energy. Yeah. Right, we okay, can? we're lighting the fire. Nice. If anybody wants to see the fire light. Yeah, he's gonna do that too. Do you need more of this paper? Yeah, All right, go to the fire. Oh, Where's the sake? 
I would not. It's a non-alcoholic stocky for the campus. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we start the fire at both ends of the kiln at the same time. Small fires are lit at the chimney base and in the fire mouth. The kiln comes to life. Convection currents begin to pull the heat through the chambers. After about three hours of candling, stoking goes up a notch and the temperature in the fire mouth begins to increase. Firing the fire mouth takes about 10 hours, blasting up to cone 12 and 13. When it reaches a maximum temperature, preparation for firing in chamber one takes place. The heat in chamber one jumps up very rapidly going from cone 05 to cone 12 in about two and a half hours. The kiln is fed from both sides and the fire ports are closed after each stoke. The stoke master watches the reduction cycle and the cone packs. When the first chamber reaches maturity, stoking begins in chamber two. At this point, both chambers are fired hard for about five minutes, reducing both at the same time. At the end of the double chamber cycle, chamber one is allowed to oxidize. This process is continued in each chamber for the duration of the firing. Both sides of the kiln have to be constantly monitored. The assigned stokemaster is responsible for that duty. The spirit of fire, it's uh, the flames, the, uh, the rhythm, there's a rhythm. It, it starts to breathe and, and uh, the more you give it fuel, the more the, you, know, you get a pace and then there's the heat, the heat factor starts growing and, and then with that, the, this rhythm starts picking up and, and more flames and more fire and so much heat contained inside these chamber walls and for people to be so close and feeding this, this kiln, I mean, it, it starts demanding stuff of you and so the spirit starts happening and then you know, for all of a sudden you realize that you're really in tune with the kiln. So it takes all the energy you got, you know, it takes the time, the people, and uh, the good positive concentration of all of us together. And it does take a lot of people. Fire! <laughs> the pace of the firing is judged by the stoke master observing the flames that come out of the spy holes. After each stoke, there is a six to 10 inch back pressure flame coming out of a hole at the top of the kiln door. As the fuel is consumed in the fireboxes, the spy hole flames begin to breathe back into the kiln. That is the signal to stoke again. We call it the tongue of the dragon. Stoke! When I think about the climbing kiln, one of the things that stands out most directly in my mind is an experience I had when I walked into one of the museums down in San Francisco. And in front of me was a large tomba jar. And I had this instantaneous sense of knowing it from its very beginnings through its completion. Because we had built the climbing kill and we had made our own clay and we had fired it uh, in this using essentially the same technology that had been used hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The kiln interior at Cone 12 is a beautiful sight. The gloss on the finished pieces is magnificent. A very hard reduction cycle of approximately five minutes in the final chamber creates a tremendous amount of excitement. The firing is nearly complete. 
pictures. Things are blowing up. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. No. Did you say stop? No. That's good for now. I better get those in there. Wow, that's a dragon, all right. Wow. Okay, close that door, you know. Take pictures. Don't take pictures. I'm going to cry. Woo! No. <laughs> get back, Josh. Cool yourself off. Oh, wow, look at that. Fuck. There are things about that kiln and being around that place that were earth chain life changing for me. I I was a different person after I left the first time we fired that kiln. If I have to stop somewhere along the way at home, then at least I won't look like a I won't look like a um, plasterer. I don't want to be mistaken for a plasterer. I didn't realize that ceramics could be so all-encompassing. I didn't realize the fire could be so uh, transforming. I didn't realize the fire could do that. After the fire is finished, the kiln is usually allowed to cool for two to three days. Anticipation mounts as the doors come down and the unloading begins. But there's going to be one person at the chamber. We're going to be taking these hot pots out. These pots are hot, the shelves are hot, everything's hot. So you don't stand, if you're this person, you don't stand here and look at this pot. They come out, and they go over on the ground, we'll get about, uh, looks like you got maybe four or five people in each chamber. You pass them out, and a couple people are running them over. Unloading the kiln is payback time. Finished pieces are passed from hand to hand as they come out of the chambers. The kiln is indifferent to identity. The fire removes the fluff. The group dynamic creates a single entity with a hundred hands. It is an involvement of the mind, the body, and the spirit. A total giving to the fire. 